Cool. Welcome everyone to um, today's event on what's happening in Ethiopia. Um, so my name is Promise Lee and I'm an activist and writer from Hong Kong and Los Angeles. I'm a member of Internationalism from Below and also Laosan Collective. Um, this event is organized by Internationalism from Below and supported by Haymarket Books platform. And this will be recorded and available for further viewing um, after this event. And I just want to briefly thank the co-sponsors of this event, um, Review of African Political Economy and Africa as a Country um, um, for co-sponsoring this event. And just a brief introduction on um, the series that um, IFB Internationalism from Below has been organizing. Um, IFB is a grassroots network of activists, left-wing activists that seek to build transnational solidarity with and between mass and other mass movements and various kinds of ma marginalized movements. We specifically formed as an alternative to the dominant tendencies in the anti-war and anti-imperialist left that whitewashed the violence of, sub, um, of various oppressive regimes like Syria, Iran, China, Ethiopia, Venezuela, and et cetera, in the name of simply combating U.S. imperialism. We have been running a political education series of what's happening in X country to feature activists and scholars that can speak to ongoing struggles in various regions and we recently done a few events on regions from Myanmar to Cuba. And stay tuned for our further programming on Sudan. Um, so the, there's a kind of complicated war of narratives happening, especially with what's happening in Ethiopia, with the Ethiopian and Eritrean regimes genocidal onslaught on, on Tigrayans and, and other ethnic minorities. And how do we make sense of all of this and contextualize all this in Ethiopia's larger history and political con uh, situation? Um, is something that we're going to try to begin to address um, in this panel with the three very amazing speakers um, who I'm about to intro in a second, and I'll pass it on to them. So we'll have um, a few minutes of opening remarks from each speakers, and I'll read out their bios in just a second, and we'll go into a more free flow conversation um, um, and Q&A among the few of us um, after the opening remarks. So to begin, Mabel Gebermethine is the founder and president of Tigray Action Committee, a nonprofit committed to helping end the suffering of millions of Tigrayans due to the hashtag Tigray genocide. Our second speaker um, will be Ayantu Tepezo, who is a scholar focusing on transnational indigenous or remote knowledge production and archival erasure and the construction of Ethiopian national narratives. She is a Coda Robos fellow and a doc doctoral student in information studies in UCLA. And our third and final speaker is Jay Khadija Abdurrahman, who is a founder and director of We Be Imagining at Columbia University's Insight Center in the American Assembly's Democracy and Trust Program. They are also a Tech Impact Network Research Fellow at NYU's AI Now Institute, in partnership with UCLA C212 and UWA Law School. Their research focuses on the predictive analytics in the New York City child welfare system and the role of tech in mass atrocities in the Horn of Africa. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to our first speaker, Mabel, um, who will kick us off with some opening remarks. Um, take it away. Thank you so much, Promise. Um, I do wanna say thank you to all the organizers of this event. It's a big deal that you guys are doing this and I really am appreciative of it. And I'd also like to say that I'm feeling very honored to be on this panel with these incredible, incredible people. Um, what I'm gonna start with is just giving a bit of history, just a little bit of history of Tigray, just to get an understanding of it. <clears throat> Tigray is the northernmost region of Ethiopia. Um, it borders Eritrea to the north, Amhara to the south, Afar to the east, and Sudan to the west. Um, today, the Ethiopian government is committing a genocide on its own citizens in Tigray. Millions have been displaced, hundreds of thousands have been killed, 90% of the population is on the brink of starvation due to a, a government forced famine, and countless others have become victims of sexual based violence. Tigray has a population of between six to seven million residents, and that is pre-genocide. What that number is now, we won't know until Ethiopia's government has ended its siege of Tigray and allowed investigators or investigations in. Um, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali is continuing Ethiopia's legacy of prosecuting Tigrayans based on their ethnicity and ethnicity alone. This is not Tigray's first genocide, uh, it's facing its third. I was born in the second genocide committed against Tigrayans in the, between the 1970s and early 90s, while my parents were born in the first genocide started by then King Haslase in 1943. My grandparents have witnessed our family be torn apart three times. This must be the last genocide. Abiy Ahmed started his genocidal campaign against Tigrayans on November 4th, 2020. Using the world's fixation on the United States election as a disguise, he punched Tigray in complete darkness. 
meaning telecommunications, electricity, banking, and more, were all turned off in Tigray on that day. Abi boasted that his law and order, law and order campaign would only last a few weeks and that no civilians would be hurt. What we soon learned was Abi's claims were nothing but hot air. Uh, the first news that came out of Tigray were from then ten, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of Tigrayan refugees that fled to Sudan. Camps that had been dormant and shuttered for 30 plus years were now frantically being resurrected to fit the immense needs of traumatized people. These were the camps that my sister and I were both born in. I was born in a refugee camp. I have lived the life of a refugee. The stories the new Tigrayan refugees shared were horrific. They told stories of being dragged out of their homes and watching non tigrayan neighbors steal their property and belongings. Stories of Ethiopian soldiers shooting and killing children. Stories of Eritrean soldiers killing hundreds of people congregating in a church. Stories of soldiers, Ethiopian and Eritrean, turning schools into rape factories. Tigrayan women have faced some of the most horrific acts ever committed throughout this genocide. Sorry, it makes me emotional because I am a Tigrayan woman. And so this happening is happening to me. It's happening to my sisters. It's happening to my aunts. It's happening to my nieces. When the genocide started, I felt powerless, but angry and determined. 98% of my family is still in Tigray. My father, who was a U.S. citizen, is currently trapped there. My grandmothers, whom I have not spoken with for over 400 days, are also trapped. My family is being held hostage by Ethiopia's government as we speak. I realized that rather than just be angry, I could find ways to help end the suffering of my people, or at least hoped that I could. In January of this year, my sister and I launched a nonprofit called Tigray Action Committee, which is what Promise um, referred to earlier. We did this so that we could help find ways to make the world aware of the atrocities Tigrayans are facing. We've met with legislators throughout the United States to make them aware of the genocide and push them to take decisive action to end the humanitarian suffering. What we quickly, quickly learned is that the U.S. really believes in Abiy and his government. We learned that many lawmakers in the U.S. champion Abiy and Ethiopia's sovereignty, but how can a country be sovereign when it's asked other nations to massacre its citizens? How can Ethiopia be a sovereign nation when it's asked Eritrea, it's asked United Emirates, it's asked Turkey to kill its citizens, its own citizens? We have launched a campaign pushing for the need to label what is happening to Tigrayans a genocide. Genocide is defined as the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. For over a year, Tigrayans have faced this reality, from mass killing to forced sterilization to mass incarceration. By labeling these atrocities what they are, the international community will be forced to act in stopping further atrocities and prevent them from happening in the future. What Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is currently doing is arresting Tigrayans, Ethiopian citizens who are of Tigrayan ethnicity in Addis for literally just being Tigrayans. He has opened concentration camps. He has a lot of, excuse me, allowed a lot of horrific things to happen within the country, and no one is stopping him, including the United States. The United States has really pushed him and has continued to support him, and it's been devastating for us. We don't understand why. Um, I'll never understand why, personally. If this is not labeled a genocide, we Tigrayans will continue to face genocide by the hands of Ethiopia's government. This will never end for us until there is no Tigrayan culture and there is no Tigrayan ethnicity. And so it's really, really important that this be labeled properly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very, very powerful opening remarks, Havel. Um, here, I'll pass it on to Ayantu. Um, thank you, Mabel, um, for getting us started. Um, I know this is difficult. Um, I, I know you've given like a variation of this speech so many times over the last year. Um, thank you also to all the co-sponsors of this event. Um, thank you for making this space for us to talk about Ethiopia a little bit, um, especially because uh, like Promise said in the beginning, there is a lot of contest over every aspect of this war, including like the narratives, who did what and all of that. Um, but I think it's so important to contextualize the current war in the larger project of Ethiopian state consolidation um, 
namely how should we understand the Ethiopian state? What does it do? Whose identities, cultures, economic interests and well-being does it maintain? Who are the people it earmarks for routine exploitation, subjugation and elimination? And what does this war tell us about the state's workings and imaginings and its discourses and how it engenders war, genocide and displacement? I think often Ethiopia is viewed through a strong mythological image that portrays it as a unique state, not just on the African continent, but perhaps in the entire world. And the state's identity is so shrouded in such a powerful political religious symbolism that even 50 years of critical scholarship on the Ethiopian state has largely failed to make a real dent in how the world understands um, this country. Um, of course, Mythologies are not unique to Ethiopia. Every state has its mythology, but it never quite uh, fails to surprise me how taken for granted Ethiopian state mythology is and how well it appears to work in providing an alibi to the state, even as it commits atrocity after atrocity after atrocity against many different communities um, in the country. Um, at the center of this mythology is this idea that whereas every other country in Africa is made by colonialism or is entangled in colonialism, Ethiopia is untouched by it and is therefore free of uh, colonial entanglements, that it is a country of predominantly Christian people who all speak Amharic and of course live happily ever after. Um, but like what interests me about this mythology, which has many different components, which for sake of time, I cannot get into. Um, what really interests me, though, is the stories and the histories and the memories that it renders invisible or that it conceals. Um, take, for example, the story of the late 19th century conquest that is the defining event and process for the creation of the Ethiopian state that we that we know today. Few people outside of Ethiopia seem to register the fact that between 1870 and 1900, the Amhara king Menelik II launched a massive war of conquest, annexing territories belonging to previously independent peoples, such as the Waleita, the, the Oromo, the Sidama, the Kafa, and so on, um, on all of these people then become incorporated into this emerging Ethiopian empire. Um, or that the borders of these territories uh, that are set by Menelik are actually given international recognition by the 1906 tripartite treaty, which was signed by France, Britain, and Italy. And just as European weapons were instrumental in the conquest itself, European recognition sets in stone what today many Ethiopian nationalists like to call Ethiopian territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, but like, you might wonder, why does the conquest of late 19th century matter? Um, and I think it matters because in a way we are living deep in its aftermath, uh, the Menelik state and more so the Haile Selassie one imagined the disappearance of the conquered peoples and their political arrangements and their languages and their colonialized groups in Ethiopia have a robust in their knowledge and memory system. From the state's perspective, trying to hold these various groups together under the barrel of the gun, under the same set of logic and arrangement that which uh, conquest ushered in and through which they were brought into this uh, set of arrangement we call Ethiopian state today, has been the single focus to ensure that the state remains as it is. And in this goal, Whoever happens to be ruling the Ethiopian state, uh, whether it's uh, Haile Selassie or the um, or or um, now Abi Ahmed, there's always been international support for this territorial integrity for holding this this together this state that has been shaped and made by conquest and the and the ensuing relationships that it it produced. Um, today, dozens of Oromo, um, sorry. Um, not dozens, actually, hundreds of Oromo, Sidama, and many Southern activists and political leaders have been imprisoned for over a year. All of them are opposed to the kind of state Abe is building, a state that follows in the footsteps of Menelik and Haile Selassie, a centralized st state that strips historically marginalized groups of the little bit of autonomy they've gained over the last 30 years. Um, that indigenous African nations should permanently be replaced by European style 
um, nation states, maybe the consensus that emerges out of the 1960s Pan-African Agreement, but most people in Africa continue to struggle against this arrangement. Um, and this is not just unique to Ethiopia. The European state model has really failed Africans. It has degraded our indigenous governance systems, knowledge systems, conflict resolution mechanisms. Um, and as our planet is, you know, is in absolute chaos, it has also degraded indigenous ways of caring and being, you know, with the earth. Um, and I think Ethiopia is the perfect example of that failure of this relationship between African indigenous nations and the nation states that are brought brought and placed in, in Africa after colonialism. But let me end by saying that the current war in Ethiopia, in my view, is an attempt to accomplish by force and through war and through genocide what could not be accomplished peacefully or democratically because it is against the wish of the vast majority of Ethiopia's people, which is the eradication of not just the federal system in Ethiopia, which has been in place since 1991, but the very idea of a pluralistic Ethiopia that is not only home to multiple nations, but that recognizes their sovereignty as well. And I, um, and I think part of what gets lost in all this discourse on, um, on this war is the fact that Abiy Ahmed Abiy Ahmed's government is pursuing a political project that has a clear history, that has a set of aims, and that has um, that is very clear about what it wants. Even though in international um, stage this doesn't get enough recognition, people in Ethiopia know what it means when the state when the state begins talking to them about uh, unity and and so on. Because unity in this sense is erasure and its elimination, and uh, which is pursued by the state whether one wants it or not. Tigray is at the receiving end of the violence of this state precisely because Tigray has the capacity to resist the centralizing. Um, mission of Abbey. Um, but also like the resistance continues in the south and people are being attacked even just for being perceived as potentially resisting Abiy Ahmed's project. Um, but let me just stop there because um, we'll have more um, in the later round. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those very rich comments, Antti. I think we will have uh, more time to expand a lot of those elements. and. You could do if you want to wrap us up before we move into a, a conversation together. All right. Thank you. I'm a little bit, if you guys know me, you know, I got ADD. So I got like five different papers. I'm going to try to read off real quick. Um, but number one, like really, really thank you to Haymarket, to Internationalism from Below, Review of African Political Economy in Africa as a Country. I mean, it's just really, I mean, to be honest with you, shocking to have this platform and to speak to the self-identified left because um, part of the way this war has played out is through mis and disinformation, a lot of which has taken um, the veneer of leftism. Although I wanna be careful not to call the transnational trolls or like faux leftist guns for hire leftists, because I mean, really these people have become agents of the state. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was thinking about in preparing for this event is February 1915, when Woodrow Wilson played uh, Birth of a Nation, portraying the Ku Klux Klan as heroes. Um, and then 10 years later, by 1925, you have the membership enrollment of the Ku Klux Klan, about two and a half million. And so when you look at this transnational organization of trolls that include academics, scholars, um, at least the appearance of a grassroots movement that are peddling pro-regime narratives that sound very similar to in the Ethiopian context, it might be hashtag no more. Uh, in the Chinese context, it might be no more, uh, no more, no new Cold War. Uh, in the Indian context, it might be a hashtag uh, Hindu phobia, um, producing the dominant bra dominant caste Brahmins as the phobic object, even as they support Narendra Modi, uh, who came to power uh, from Gujarat uh, after the 2006 pogrom of the Muslims, right? And we see the same thing. And so we were like cracking up. There were so many um, kind of trolling comments on the event uh, tweet. But our very, very favorite is uh, from a No More account that said, how dare you have an event on Ethiopia featuring no Ethiopians? And here we are, you know, we have two people who are in the Romo diaspora, somebody else who's in the Tegru diaspora, and we are rejected from this category that is known as Ethiopian. And so we have this production of this universal that is also signaling the exclusion of the others. And so despite the fact that a lot of these people claim to be Pan-Africanists, 
a lot of times what they're reproducing is war on terror language, both in the sense that, you know, the, the, the site of political dissent is identified as a terrorist and that the actions that are being called for are a reproduction of Guantanamo Bay and the kind of torture techniques and underground um, shipping container incarceration that we see in Eritrea, most recently featured in Escaping Eritrea on PBS. But we know that this does not just exist under Isaiah Sefuerke, right, the president of Eritrea. This is all these forms of incarceration, brutality and torture are part of this cycle of conquest and ongoing colonization and wake of slavery throughout the Horn of Africa. And so despite we have this notion of African solutions to African problems, like what does this what does this really mean and what does this signal? It surely does not signal the anti-colonial demands and land claims of indigenous people. It surely does signal uh, the rights of West Westphalian states over and above and excluding those indigenous and other oppressed peoples. Um, and so I just I wanted to thank you guys because we're in desperate need of solidarity at this moment. And, um, you know, it's just really notable which ideologies, desires and political projects are able uh, to see kind of the need for this kind of conversation. Uh, and also in that note, shout out to Zoe Sesmuzzi, who I know that you guys have had on uh, Haymarket. And uh, she did an amazing event with Badura Lagra and um, and S.A. Smythe around catastrophe, crisis and uh, genocide. Um, sorry, I'm like losing my thoughts. Oh, so Zoe hit us up off of Twitter because um, she solicited us for an Against Genocide edition of the magazine asking us to do a piece, Tigray, Oromia, and the Ethiopian Empire. So I just wanted to share a few of the interventions that we were trying to make in that piece. Um, one of which is, uh, you know, we really make an effort not to use the term ethnicity and to really focus on nationality and particularly how uh, the multinational federalist constitution represents the political and historical drivers of the current conflict. Uh, and the reason is because uh, in Kalundi Saramaga, in uh, an article that we're going to provide, I think, afterwards in the follow up email, really solicits how Mamdani in 19, actually, I'm not forget the year, I can't remember, uh, but Mamdani, uh, I'm losing my thought. I'm so goddamn nervous. You know, I'm like, uh, I hate Zoom. Uh, forget that. But um, I guess from a technological perspective, uh, what we were trying to intervene is that the second wave tech clash tends to follow a typical story arc, critique the techno solutionism of corporate entities funding technologists and engineers to solve complex social phenomena with technical solutions, highlight how these te said technologies present these solutions as politically neutral or universal, or even claim that applying algorithms and automated decision systems to social ills are a way to mitigate human bias, then trace how these claims are a fallacy. Um, and we saw this in the in, in the disclosure of the Facebook papers, right? Like the ceiling of the claims that were made in that reporting and the news cycle is already over, even though there's an ongoing genocide, was to subsidize additional languages uh, for content moderation. But it didn't really address and begin with the political and historical context in which these technologies are developed and the markets in which they enter into. Um, so in other words, the second wave tech clash can seize the development and deployment of technology is political, but it makes the critique from the standpoint of inevitability. Um, due to the word count limitations, we were only able to make cursory remarks about UNHCR's refugee biometrics, but what the piece as a whole was trying to bring forward is a different framework and story arc with which we can critique and begin to engage questions around technology. Um, and then my colleague Morali Shan Mugavelan's work on CAS and the internet has given me language to explain this uh, difference in methodology. In a recent talk on casting Indian media unsettling secular mythologies, he explains how in his work he uses a practice approach that moves away from text or productions um, or even just structures or political economy to open-ended range of practices on media. In other words, decentering the media in order to understand or study how caste is articulated in the media. So similarly, in Tigray Aramia and the Ethiopian Empire, we try to decenter platform governance, focusing on Ethiopian state formation, including this history of colonization, conquest, and genocide, to think through how Ethiopia is reproduced as a political project on the internet and through the capture of refugees into biometric systems, rather than accepting these categories of hate speech and missing disinformation on themselves, because one of my big issues is one, these are vacuous categories that really don't um, provide us any kind of conceptual analysis to address the issue. Um, and then two is that they often hail a kind of policing or carceral logic where the focus is on identifying and deplatforming bad actors. And then the last two points that I wanted to make 
is that tech research often lacks rigor, which in part can be attributed to the corporate capture of knowledge production, uh, eloquently described by Meredith Whitaker in a recent edition of ACM Interactions that I had the honor to co-edit with my colleague Suchetta Goshal, and in particular, the systematic silencing of more radical black scholars like Timnit Gebru by uh, quote-unquote Fang uh, corporations or Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google. Uh, the neutralizing of political dissent against the corporations who fund tech research is not the whole story, though. The political neutralization of tech research has been effective because it is happening in the context of institutional austerity and fragmentation or silencing, siloing of disciplines. It is true that computer scientists are unlikely to spend any significant time in their PhD program engaging black study, as it is unlikely for those in black studies to spend any significant time in their PhD program engaging computer science. The framework in which we think about the Ethiopian empire is trying to say, hey, how do we think through the lens of tech and black study together? It's trying to say it's not enough to critique the ahistoricalness of tech or AI ethics research. We have to begin from the historical context and the local material conditions in which social phenomena are produced, or as uh, Morali more eloquently articulated, we have to decenter the digital in order to study the production of the sociopolitical. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is this methodolo methodological demand is all also deepened by a focus on indigeneity, a moral and epistemic commitment to understand or approach the now through the peripheries and through the oppressed. So in other words, it's not just our like interpersonal and kind of ancestral origin connection to Oromia that we demand to think with that alongside Tigray, but it's also what can we see when we're outside the center? when we're looking away from centralization and seeing other ways of knowing and other forms of governance. And there has been just a dearth of analysis um, about Ethiopia, despite the amount of coverage that has been produced. And in part, it's because of NGOs and humanitarian organizations that have been kind of refereeing the body counts on both sides, creating this uh, false equivalence uh, between regional militias and different political parties and the Ethiopian federal state. Um, and just absent any kind of uh, political analysis. And the other part is that, you know, America, for, for historical reasons, and a lot of times people say the West or international community, but it feels like that often just means America and the U.S. State Department, is unable to think about an Ethiopia that doesn't center the North. But in order to understand what is happening in Tigray, we have to look at what has happened in Somali, what has happened in Jail Agadan, what is happening to the other nations and nationalities that are concealed by this mythology of Ethiopian exceptionalism. Great, thanks, thanks for that, Khadija. There's a, that was a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of concepts for us to kind of think through together, especially in this very complicated situation. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of things to address. I really like this general turn towards, you know, contextualizing and situ um, situating what's happening in Tigray um, and this broader, broader conception of what it means um, to talk about Ethiopian statehood as it connects historically, right, to other moments in time, right, and seeing this not as a unique kind of distinguished moment, right? But then it's often cyclical, right? As, as Mabel was saying, right? That this isn't the first time that some of this stuff is happening. So before we maybe get into the, the nitty gritty stuff of, of the diaspora landscape of, of, of the Ethiopia state building stuff, I wanna kind of um, recenter and turn to actually uh, some stuff in Mabel's opening remarks, right? On, on the need to label what's going on on the ground a genocide, right? I think that's a very important claim, right? And it's, I think it's, it's a claim that's central to um, degree action committees uh, organizing work. So I just want to give space and, and, and invite you to see if you have any more um, more to say about, well, yeah, T TAC's own organizing work and history in itself in the last year or two. Um, what does it mean to label a genocide? Why is that important? And maybe just some, maybe take, taking a step back, right? What are some, um, you know, what, what is the international community, right? Uh, a word that we've, we've, we've been interrogating already, right? In the opening remarks, you know, what, what are the challenges and difficulties around labeling a genocide? Why is that, why are there these difficulties? And you know, yeah, why is it important to break through that? And what are some obstacles and pushbacks that you might have seen um, and want to encourage folks to think out of in this moment? Sure. So the reason that we are pushing so hard for it to be labeled a genocide is, first off, it is. An entire ethnicity is, is in the process of being wiped off the earth. The Ethiopian government has gone into Tigray and taken IDs and changed the identification to no longer say Tigray but instead to say Amhara or a different um, ethnicity. Um, they have not allowed us to use Tigrinya, which is our language. Um, Tigrinya music can't be played in Addis Ababa, in the capital of Ethiopia. 
uh, without being arrested or having your business closed or having your car stopped and being ticketed. So it's different forms of genocide that are, are happening, but an ethnicity is being wiped away. Absolutely. Um, women have been raped and by Ethiopian soldiers as well as Eritrean soldiers and told while being raped that the reason they were being raped was so that they would no longer have to grind children. They have had rods, hot rods, put inside their bodies so that they cannot no longer conceive ever again. They've had their children killed in front of them so that those children don't grow up and be Tigrayan. Women have had children. There's a story that Lucy Casa, um, the journalist, who reported that, um, I'm sorry, the story is, it's, it's, it's really hard to hear, it's hard to read, and it's hard to remember. But what happened was this Tigrayan woman mother had two children with her one was a baby one was a four-year-old and they were escaping their home because they were terrified and they understood what was coming for them so they were escaping their home to run to Makela, which is the capital city of tigray to safety but again safety is not really safe in a genocide that's a very relative term this it's not what we have here in our little space on skype you know it's relative so this was the safest area that she could get to and it was going to take her days to get there but she had to do it and so she was walking with her two children and she saw Ethiopian soldiers. When the Ethiopian soldiers stopped her, they were speaking to her in Amharic. The little four-year-old boy stopped his mother and said, are those the bad guys? Why are you speaking that language? Are those the bad guys? Are those Abi Ahmed's friends? Are they uh, dictator Isaias' friends in Tigrinya? The Ethiopian soldier heard the Tigrinya and was like, oh, well, what is he saying to you? The way he's saying it, I know he's saying something naughty, what is he saying to you? The mother obviously was very nervous about what was going to happen to her son. and was like, oh, <laughs> nothing is happening. Everything is okay. She tried to calm her son down. But her son's response was, why can't we just throw rocks at them and go home? I want to go home. The Ethiopian soldier continued to see the escalation from the little boy. He saw the tantrum, tantrum starting. And instead of being a human or maybe... I'm not sure how old the Ethiopian soldier was, but let's say like an adult. Instead of being someone who saw a child and was like, let me just let them go. He killed the little boy in front of his mother and said, if he is going to speak like this now, what's he going to say when he's older? What's he going to do to us when he's older? That is genocide. You are killing children so that they cannot continue, so that they can't survive, so that this culture will no longer exist. That is genocide. And so it's really, really, truly important that it's labeled for what it is. When things are not labeled properly, they continue. What's happened in Africa is that genocides have occurred and they have been labeled as civil war. They have been labeled as a political war or just something very minimal. This is not a civil war. The Ethiopian government, an entire government, is attacking an ethnicity, a minority. We are a minority in Ethiopia and we're even more a minority throughout the world. There is very little of us, especially in a country where there's a hundred and something million citizens. We're only at most 7.2. So there's very, very little of us. And so this continuing to happen is definitely going to wipe us out of the, off the planet. And that needs to be labeled properly. I hope I answered that. I kind of went on a, <laughs> a little tangent. I feel very, very passionate about it. Um, I think you did ask some questions about TAC as well, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to go home? Sure, I don't mind if, it's okay. <laughs> if I still have some time. But... So um, Tigray Action Committee was started by my sister and I. We both founded it together um, after really needing to do something for our families. Again, my family is trapped in Tigray. And so it's important that we do something. We have a lot of action items on our website. Um, and one of the ways that you can assist is by going to our website and going under action items and calling your legislator, calling your government official, calling someone local to you and explaining what's happening in Tigray and explaining that it needs to be labeled a genocide. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, thanks for sharing with us the very harrowing start story that I think right encapsulates a lot of the the, the, the importance of, of this labeling, a lot of things that you're gesturing to. I want to, yeah, kind of, um, yeah, think with this, I think you, you're, you're talking about, you know, speaking Amhara, right, and, and um, Amharic, and what does it mean to talk about, um, you know, all the stuff in relation to um, Amhara hegemony, right, and, and, and privilege, right, I think that's something that I am too, and Khadija and others have, have, have tackled also specifically, right, in, in your research and writings. And so I want to invite um, I mean, Ayanta or others, right, to say more about, yeah, what is, what is, what does it mean to talk about these various um, ethnic groups in Ethiopia? What, what does it mean to talk about, um, um, 
the the relationship between Amhara and and um, and Tigre and and all these different things and relationship to Ethiopian state consolidation um, for someone who might be you know newer into the the, the ethnic discourses right in Ethiopia if if, if folks want to take a bit bit of a step back and and maybe unpack that a little bit more for us. Um, Khadija, I don't know if you would like to start or should I go? Well, I was just going to make just one comment that I think, you know, not I think, but there's a there's a distinction between genocide, the law, genocide convention and genocide, the process. And so I think it's indisputable that there is a genocide in Tigray, even by the law, when we think about um, the intent to destroy systematically in whole or in part a protected group on the basis of nationality or religion, in this case, nationality, right? Indisputably. Has there been that legal ru ruling? What is the political will and the set of infrastructure when we're thinking about legal apparatus in order to enact that? We haven't seen that. I mean, we've seen the U.S. has been gravely concerned every two weeks <laughs> since November 4th um, and is going to you know, really consider we're all stakeholders. But the, the metric for making a ruling, an official ruling by you know, uh, international bodies, which are also dominated by the U.S. again, right, has not been um, based on the facts on the ground. It's about a level of politicking and kind of international power arrangements that are separated from what we're seeing. And the other distinction I just wanted to make between genocide, the process um, and genocide, the convention is that, you know, what's happening in Tigray, I think for sure is a state of emergency, but it's not necessarily a state of exception when we're thinking about state formation to the point that saying genocidal state might even be um, redundant, right? What does it mean to form a state and what kind of erasure does it do when you're unifying an identity? And in the Ethiopian context, we can definitely see the degree to which Amharaness has been associated and conflated with state identity. Um, but maybe you want to take it from there, Antu. Um, yeah, um, I think I think it's good to start with the fact that this recent uh, operation against Tigray has been named uh, Minilix operation. Um, I think um, this says something about the political ideologies and imaginaries that are driving uh, this current war. Um, in the 20th century, the Amhara project, state project, was about forging an Ethiopian state that was built on uh, Amharic uh, and Amhara uh, cultural. Uh, myths and ideas and uh, myths of origin. Um, and this attempt failed uh, with the 1974 um, um, Haile Selassie being deposed and thereafter Oromo and many other southern groups, uh, but also Eritreans um, articulating alternative uh, political perspectives on the future of their, of their uh, whether it's regionally or of Ethiopia. Um, and we see this culminating in the war against the Derg. Of course, Derg was very similar to what Abi is doing now, very focused on centralization, focused on um, erasing this, erasing the presence of multiple different political identities and cultural identities, and sort of creating this idea that we're all one people who speak one language and who have uh, the same uh, memory of the past and, of course, the same uh, imagining of the future. Um, and, of course, this project came to end, uh, not end, since it's so hard to really, this idea was not fully defeated, but it was momentarily defeated in 1991 when uh, what can be called federalist forces come to power. Um, and from the beginning, the Amhara elites opposed the federal project. Um, they especially fought against the legal recognition that they are very, they are a, a plural group of people in Ethiopia. Um, writing in the journal Ethiopian Review in 1992, leading Amhara intellectual and recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant, Getacho Haile admonished Amharas to refuse the label Amhara and resist the attempts to lump them together, together in one region. Um, and then, like, these ideas really travel across time because just a few months ago, the leader of the national movement for Amhara echoed a similar sentiment saying 
Ethiopia is our region. What is now deemed the Amhara region, we won't accept that. And this is a move that harkens back to this idea that all of Ethiopia belongs to, to, to us. Um, and this is a, I want to be very clear that this is a political idea that's very much rooted in how the elites imagine and also work to create Ethiopia. Um, and of course, the Amhara elite position on the question of identity and empire is naturally complicated by the fact that for much of the 20th century, Amhara identity was elevated to state identity, or as Wale Wale Lin argued in 1969, to be an Ethiopian was essentially to be an Amhara. And so there is this, this, conflation, this conflation between Amharaness and Ethiopianness um, is significant uh, because of like how Ethiopia, because of this historical relationship. And so beginning from the 1960s onwards, when historically marginalized groups who'd been prevented from living as Oromo or as Somali or, um, as, or as Hadiya or as Waleita, begin embracing their own indigenous identities and rejecting the Amhara identity that the state had imposed upon them after conquest, the Amhara elites interpret this um, basically as an attack on their very being and on their identity. And so they call these, so they call these groups and these activists um, narrow nationalists, tribalists. And so to refuse this Amharanized Ethiopian identity that the state imposes on you is to be categorized as backward, um, as somebody who's narrow-minded, as somebody who's, you know, tribal um, and all of this. Um, and of course, um, then you're you're also when you demand uh, more regional autonomy, or when you demand more cultural autonomy, or um, land rights for indigenous people, then you're um, participating in what a lot of urban elites will call ethnic politics, which is um, which is also interpreted as being essentially um, against progress and against modernity. Um, but yeah, let me stop there because I feel like I went on for a while. Can I say something? I'm sorry, Khadija. <laughs> no, go ahead, you got it. I'll go ask it. Okay, I beat you to it. Um, I just wanted to mention that the term genocide, the label of genocide, has been gatekept by the West, by the international community. They are allowing us to die and be persecuted and murdered and refusing to label what's happening a genocide. It happened in Darfur, it happened in Rwanda, it's happening in Sigrai, it's happening in China, it's happening in, throughout the world. As long as it's not happening in the West, then it's allowed to happen for as long as possible before they'll actually label it correctly. And so I think it's really, really important that we hold the West and the international community with their feet under fire, even if it's just the United States, they have to act. It's not something that we can just sit and wait and wait and wait and wait to see how many people can be killed before we can label it as such. They don't have the ability to just hold on to this label and allow people to die forever. It's not okay, it's not fair. It shouldn't have happened in Darfur for as long as it did. It shouldn't have happened in Rwanda for 100 days. We are at 400 days today. Today is 400 days of Tigray genocide. And so it's really, really, really time that something happened. I wanted to say just like three three quick things. Uh, one is that I, you know I really do like Twitter as my favorite platform, and the no more uh, hashtag no more war warmongers are like a source of hilarity for days. And I really enjoyed this one post that they put up where they were showing a uh, health center in Addis, and it had the like name of the health center, the directions or whatever in English. And then underneath it, they had an Amharic. And they were like, this is an outrage. Why would we have a foreign language that would be up first? Why would not the Ethiopian language be first? And it's like the complete lack of awareness. What about the 83 plus other languages and the nations and nationalities and peoples who are concealed and who are, who are not just concealed, but excluded and banished when you conflate Ethiopianness with Amharaness? Um, so that's one. And then two is that, you know, uh, Mamba, I completely share with you. I want the genocide to end like a generation ago, two generations ago. I don't want this to continue again. I do worry 
when we center the West in our theory of political change. And so when I think about the refusal and the gatekeeping of genocide, I think about the We Charge Genocide petition with that Paul Robeson and W.B. Du Bois brought to the United Nations and that was never officially recognized, right? Where this is a, a nation state that is founded on settler colonialism, indigenous of uh, a genocide of indigenous peoples and enslavement of um, black people, right? And so like, not just what is their moral calculus and the fact that they don't operate from altruism, but when we think about the Rwandan genocide, we also have to think about how the role that the U.S. has played in NGOs and funding Kagame, who is most infamous for his extrajudicial killings, right? You know, this stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. We have to take like a regional analysis and look like how are we going to intervene? And definitely from uh, the mo no more war warmongering war standpoint or from the kind of mundanious, let's dismiss the claims of indigenous nations and I'm an Indian settler family in Uganda. So I think all of this homeland stuff is fiction um, and we need to overcome uh, ethnic division in Ethiopia and in Africa in general, that the problem is ethnicity, that the problem in Ethiopia is that Melis Sanawi and the TPLF introduced ethnicity, when in reality the question of nations and nationalities was a grassroots cause. For the no more war warmongers, what do they see that as? They see it as terrorism, right? I mean, that's why there's this conflation with the Tigrayan people, with the junta with the terrorists, this projection, this boogeyman making out of an entire peoples, this boogeyman of these unresolved questions and these contradictions that are central to Ethiopian state formation. And I think, you know, uh, oh, and what I wanted to say is that, you know, part of their narrative is there's this U.S. backed regime change, right? Like, never mind the fact that what drove out the previous regime from power was the Kero, the Oromo protesters, right? That's not visible. From within this, uh, from within this land, and so I just think, I just worry within, you know, I, this this is something I don't have the answer to, but I know is what keeps me up at night is the type of analysis we bring forward. Also, is the blueprint through which diaspora funding networks are set, and I think it's important, you know, are we going to fund click to tweet to beg the U.S. State Department to recognize our right to a free Oromia or a free Tigray? Are, are they even compelled or motivated by that? And I worry that when we attach to that and we make those type of commitments that we're due for burnout because they're not motivated. You know, no matter how many horrific stories and anecdotes that we can share about a mother who had to witness her child's execution by a callous soldier, they're not doing anything. No matter how many Eritreans were snatched back um, by the Eritrean army from Tigray, even after they fled the conscription, they're not they're not motivated to act in that way. So I think we have to think about other forms of intervention and theories of change. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Khadija. Again, a lot a lot there to unpack. But I think one specific thing, maybe, and that how do we think seriously about what it means to to think about you know what what is there to be you know how can we act in a way right that one as we're all kind of echoing here right doesn't. Um, reinforce the, the 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 kind of paradigms of U.S. imperialism, but at the same time can attend to these complexities together, right, and, and show genuine solidarity. Um, one thing I kind of uh, want to also want to pick out too, right, especially as we're, um, um, you know, really usefully thinking about this relationship between the Amhara identity, right, and, um, and Ethiopian identity that I answer you were talking about, but also specifically this conflation between TPLF, right, um, and Tigrayan people, right? A, a big criticism, right, that's being launched, right, from from these pro-regime um, trolls or narrative, right, is 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 fundamentally this both sidesism, right? This what aboutism, right? That's that's going on the ground, right? That you know, but Tigrayans or TPLF, right? And here's a slippage here, right? Is that are also massacring, you know, uh, uh, people in, in Amhara and Afar, and there 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 are these very real atrocities that have have happened, right, in Amhara and Afar. How do we make sense of that, right? And really, and I think we're already touching on this right? in relationship to um, that the purpose isn't to deny right the fact that there are you know so-called atrocities and violence right on on, on 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 different parts of this conflict but what does it mean to situate that right in a way where we're not both siding this issue right and to talk about this 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 notion of Ethiopia state building right and this long-term targeting of Tigray how do we situate right the 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 violence that certain right Tigrayan groups, right, has has also committed. But how do we, yeah, exactly, how do we kind of contextualize all of that, right, within this larger framework where there's a real genocide happening in Tigray, right? And that this is um, linked, right, to Ethiopian state building, to a notion of 
um, Amhara privilege, right? That I answer you're hopefully unpacking, right? That is not reducible to also, right? On the other side, to all Amhara people, right? But it's a very specific, and I think there's something you addressed in a blog post um, before, right? That that to talk about Amhara privilege, right? Is not, is not you know, anti-Amhara in the sense that we're, we're completely against everyone who, 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 who's ethically Amhara, right? But to attack this notion, right? That's essentially um, weaponized, right? And it's a very real part of Ethiopian state building, right? And um, so I just find that, that there are a lot of these categories that are, that are often slipping and if folks want to kind of comment um, more on some of these, these issues before we talk more about like the stuff that Khadija has raised about, you know, technology, about US imperialism and action, if anyone wants to jump in. Well, just on the, oh, go ahead. We should be talking over each other. Go ahead, Mabel. No, I, it, that was a lot promised. So <laughs> it's a lot to unpack. But I think it's really important to remember that TPLF is a government. They are a political party. And they were a political party, or still are, a political party that Tigrayans voted in. Tigrayans citizens and residents had a legal election, and they voted for the party that they wanted to vote for. And I think it's really important to remember and separate that from actual Tigrayan people. Tigrayans are a people. We are human beings who breathe, eat, live, shit, sex, all of it. We are human beings. And so for us to constantly be um, labeled a political party, a government, it doesn't make any sense. I am a human being, but I am a Tigrayan woman. I am a human being. I am not TPLF. I am not a government. I am not a Democrat. I am not Biden. I am Maba government. And so it makes life really, really hard when I'm constantly being attached to a government in the no more campaign a hashtag no more and their friends and such have done a very good job of attaching us to that so once the ethiopian government labeled tplf terrorists and no more is associating human beings to a government we have become terrorists that doesn't work i am a human being like you know and so i think a lot of that time they're forgetting what they're doing they're affecting people's lives every single day life every every little bit of my life now i'm a terrorist is that right no and to for the ethiopian government i just also want to say to label tplf a terrorist and then expect the entire world to do the same it's been very very interesting to see that the rest of the world refuses to do that that's all i want to say go ahead Khadija. <laughs> Um, what I wanted to say is that, you know, I think we took a long time to even develop the event description here because it's hard for even even in the conversation between the three of us. It's so difficult to get access to Ethiopian state formation. We have context. We are news junkies. We stuck in the cycle. We catch in every update. And even for us to summarize what's going on and how do you think of through Ethiopia in two paragraphs is very difficult. But one of the central commitments of writing that piece is that we believe survivors and believing survivors is hard in, in, in a place like Ethiopia, where it's not just a developing country and to like echo digital divide discourse, but it's a place where, you know, reporting can get you killed and at the very least get deported. And so people have a legitimate distrust of a lot of the information that's going on, not in the sense that it's maybe not true, but what's curated presents a very uneven depiction of what's happening. And so I think, you know, there definitely are atrocities that are being committed in Amhara, in Afar, the thing is that there's definitely an asymmetry between the centralized Ethiopian state unleashing its entire arsenal, uniquely directing it to Tigray and inviting the Eritrean uh, federal forces to come in and massacre its own citizens. At the very same time, we also know that in Benishango Gumuz, in Somali, in uh, among the Kemat, there's uh, systematic dispossession, extrajudicial killings in Oromia, there is conscription, there is uh, famine, people are having their paychecks, uh, money removed out of their paychecks every year, uh, sorry, every month throughout the year uh, to subsidize this war. There's definitely like a conditional relationship where it's not just that there's a war in Tigray and there's a war in the South. But there's a relationship between the North and the South that is such that the ongoingness of state violence in Oromia and through the SN, SNNPR, Southern Nations, Nationalities, People's Region, uh, is, is not legible, it's not visible, it happens under our cover all the time, and it is funding this ongoing genocide. So, I mean, we even hear about rural farmers having to sell, like, animals to subsidize the Ethiopian National Defense Force, having their kids stolen in order to fight a war that is not 
we we have no stake in Menelik's political project, yet our children are being taken, right? Um, and then just like a, a few points on the, uh, you know, guns for hire disinformation people and around tech is that I'm so, so grateful for Ayantu because try and Google Ethiopia, is Ethiopia the first never colonized state? Are, are, are the TPLF terrorists or all Tigrayan terrorists? What you're going to find is a whole bunch of blogs from fascistic uncles. Because what Google does is technically amazing, right? In a fraction of the second, it is indexing like 1.7 million pages that are on the internet based on those keywords that you enter. But we as human beings, right? When we're, when we're interacting it with it, we're just looking at the first page of results. And there's an algorithm that doesn't have context. And frankly, I mean, up until recently, it didn't even have human content moderation or kind of any human capacity or even NLP hate speech lexicons or sorry, natural language processing hate speech lexicons uh, for Amharic, for Tigrinya, for Afana Romo, never mind the 83 languages in total that are spoken in Ethiopia, right? But you're seeing that first page of results and very much like what Sophia Noble documents in Algorithms of Oppression is uh, when the white kid, I can't remember, it was Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, no, Dylan Roof. And he was looking at, you know, are, are black people racist against white people or reverse racism against white people? And he found the very information that verified his own white supremacist attitudes. And he, then he went on to go murder a whole bunch of black people. Right. That's the same experience. Even for us, it is very difficult to find out this history. I grew up in a very close-knit Aroma community in New York. I didn't learn anything about Tigrinya knowledge production. I didn't really understand a lot about the history of Tigray. That has been like a new experience here, and it's very relational. It's very through oral traditions, and it's very difficult to have access to it. And we're not designing these technologies, the affordances of which elevate fascistic entities. And I think there's big questions here for the left, because as much as they identify Africa as some kind of tabula rasa to project their like Freudian id onto, instead of dealing with it as a place, the same issue does exist for mutual aid. And so I think we really have to think about this thing that we have been super reliant on, particularly in the pandemic, right? And it's like this pinnacle of kind of anarchic organizing, is also the mechanism through which these disinformation networks are laundering money to support a genocide. There is no critique and discourse in tech that can prepare you for the Derg Mengistu 2.0 being a Patreon content creator. You know, we talk about the gig economy, but like how has this climate of austerity enabled a state to launder money to its federal government, murdering its own people while performing what looks like a grassroots movement? And so I'm just trying to say there's these like nexus, this like interest convergence around technology, genocide and kind of what is our political imagination? What how how can we get out here? Because these sounds. These sound like academic questions, and I want to be sensitive to that. Like, sometimes people be like, Khadija, you bringing up word salad. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But the thing is, is we're not going to get free. We're not going to get free if we just keep click to tweeting at Karen Bass. And we're not going to get free if we keep just arguing with the fascists. They on payroll. They never going to agree with us, right? Like, especially they're not going to dissent against these sides of Ferke. Like, they don't want to be in a shipping container, right? So we're not winning that way. So what is our political strategy? How are we going to get out? Um, sorry, can I just uh, quickly go back to the initial question? I uh, promise if we still have time. Please, please, all the time left. Yeah. Um, okay, I often, I, I feel like I often take for granted that when I'm talking about like organized Amhara elite political projects that people assume that I'm not speaking about ordinary Amhara people who um, in this war have been victims. Um, um, in, in, you know, once the, T, once the TDF crossed over to Amhara region, to Apar region, more civilians were impacted by this war. And I feel like that's often clear to me, but like maybe I need to say that part out loud. Um, um, and then I just wanted to clarify, like, why the Amhara nationalist component of this is so important to this war. Um, Amhara politicians and activists often proclaim that they don't believe in ethnic based territories or politics and that they fight for a unified Ethiopian identity and state. Um, yet they lay claim to the whole of Ethiopia as their birthright, as Nama um, and other political groups do. 
But in practice, not only have Amara elites proven not opposed to ethnic politics, but they have supported and justified some of the worst forms of ethnic cleansing of Western Tigray on the basis that this land belongs to them. In one year, Amhara militia have ethnically cleansed 1.2 million Tigrayans from Western Tigray. Under this ideology, they continue um, their attacks against the Karayu community. Um, again, there's attacks. These attacks by Amhara militia are state backed. They're backed by the central government. And I feel like that distinction is so important. Um, and what the Amhara militia have done in Tigray in cooperation with the Ethiopian military, in cooperation with the Eritrean military, is a logical conclusion of a dangerous, irredentist, expansionist ideology that is held today by almost all officially registered Amhara political parties. And this is why I feel like this is why we're talking about Amhara nationalism and why it matters in this war. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those great answers. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, other other uh, kinds of threads that are brought up, I think, that we can pursue, right? I'm especially interested, I think, in um, especially the fact that, yeah, you know, uh, folks here are in the diaspora, right? And that, you know, this isn't really, and I think I want to kind of underline something that Khadija has, has all said, right? That these are technologies of global fascism, right? And I think that's that's a phrase you use in the recent piece, right, on that you co-authored, right, and grieving in the face of fascism, right, which I thought was a really, really um, provocative, and interesting piece that ties a lot of threads together, right, because this is not just, right, uh, talking about um, things that are uh, unique to what's going on in Ethiopia, right? This is a larger network, right, in which global fascism, um, authoritarian regimes, and disinformation kind of interact with each other, especially when we talk about um, data and those things. So, yeah, I just encourage folks, invite folks to think more about, yeah, what, what are the, um, especially now that we're talking about these diaspora funding networks, right, that you're, you're mentioning, or the hashtag no more campaign, right, and that in a sense, these rhetoric, they're being recycled, right, in different regions. How do we make sense of, of this phenomenon, right, especially in relation to, um, you know, U.S. imperialism, right, and talking about this category of imperialism that a lot of, uh, you know, pro, pro regime folks, right, in Ethiopia, are, are identifying with, like, if you support Abiy Ahmed, you're somehow this anti-imperial, right, uh, uh, kind of champion. And what does it mean that that narrative is being propped up while while people who are actually speaking out against um, what's happening in Decray are being seen as like, U.S. backed, right, as being Western backed, right? Well, but what I think what everyone's talking about here is specifically unpacking that binary, right? It's not that, you know, if you support this side, you're it's 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 US backed, and if you support this side, you're anti-imperialist, right? Is that, you know, things are much more complicated, especially with with um, you know, the different, you know, quote unquote international community community, right? And Western regimes that actually supported uh, the its regime, right? Um, um, um in, in, in the last couple of years. So what does it make sense to, you know, talk about? And I think because these are others are also talking about war on terror rhetoric, right? That's being redeployed, right? Um in 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 Ethiopia in Ethiopia by the regime can folks say more maybe about yeah these interconnections that go beyond Ethiopia right but then the facts that and the fact that you know as someone I think I talked to said states learn from each other right nation states have learned from each other's in these various uh, uh, genocidal uh, campaigns so what does it mean to talk about the interfacing between these different regimes of of of, of terror and especially that language of counter terror that I think Khadija you're you're bringing up. How do we make sense of of these interconnections a bit more, if if someone wants to take a take a stab? I'm just staring at my bell because I feel like every time I talk, I'm cutting you off. You want to go first? He's um, like, who wants, babe? That's all you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the two things that I was gonna bring up is one you know, thinking through Operation Solomon under the Dirk, where you have this U.S. designed cluster bombs that were ex exported from Israel to Mengistu's regime that were dropped on the Eritrean People's Liberation Front in exchange for the Betsa Israel or the Ethiopian Jewish people, right? And so this whole thing is that West the Westphalian state is, all, is, is, is an actual material thing, but it's also a myth. 
nothing is kind of like the myth of the individual. Like all of these things have always been transnational. They have always been global. Like what is the role of Israel in the world? It's not just that we, we are not just opposing like the Israeli occupation of Palestine because it's right. And we have solidarity with the Palestinian people, but we also know that the U S funds billions of dollars into Israel. And one of their biggest things is weapons development to maintain the occupation that's then exported to, for example, immigration and customs enforcement in the U S um, and through a company like Elbit building sonic walls across the U.S.-Mexico border, right? And they're also exporting weapons and technologies to India to maintain the occupation in Kashmir, right? And so when we think about something like Guantanamo, it's the spectacle of horror, right? When that was when it was revealed as if that was the first time and it was a state of exception and not the ongoingness of the U.S. empire, but it was revealed that the CIA and U.S. intelligence forces were uh, mandating torture in this prison, you know, to, to inter, you know, interrogate uh, terrorists, right? Where was this developed and where was this fine-tuned? We could straight look to the Horn of Africa has been a major site of experimentation and development of counter-terror techniques. You, the Ethiopia, you know, the idea that Ethiopia is some kind of pan-African and pinnacle of black freedom is so ridiculous precisely because it was, it was and is the U.S.'s ally on the war on terror, Right. We have all of these uh, people being held in underground shipping containers. We have people being systematically tortured. We had, you know, under the previous regime, uh, the the EPRDF, the like uh, federal coalition forces under Zanawi receiving U.S. aid for this war on terror. And a part of that was being siphoned off to terrorize Oromos in the South were political dissidents, right? And so that is the relationship I think that we have to think about between the U.S. and Ethiopia. It's not a relationship where the U.S. is just paternalistic, mandating a regime back coup. In fact, like, I'm not sure that they're so motivated to do that. When we say it was a dependent colonial state or this kind of hybrid form of colonial governance, they do have a stake in what politically happens in Ethiopia, but they don't want all of that overhead frankly. And so that's why they're always pushing Ethiopia to like have different patrons, whether it was the Soviet Union during the time of Haile Selassie, or whether it's the present when they're receiving arms and weapons to maintain the genocide in Tigray from Turkey, um, from the UAE, right? Yeah, thanks for that. Oh, Mabel, go ahead, please. Okay. I waited my turn. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to touch on the war on terror and the myth of it. So Ethiopia there is a quote that um, a lot of the propaganda machines and companies that are working for Ethiopia are using, and it's a quote from Haas Lasse, and it's that Ethiopia is the Christian island in the Muslim sea. And they are using that to um, be allied with the United States against the war on terror, while also going to Muslim countries like Turkey and UAE and asking them for drones and asking them for assistance in murdering um, Tigrayans and other nationalities within the country. So it's 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 a lot of uh, feet on wherever I can get it. The Abi Ahmed is really just trying to appease everyone and anyone who will like him, so that he can continue to do what he wants to do. So the Christian island in the Muslim Sea working with Muslim countries to kill its own citizens. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a really important metaphor to keep in mind, right? Um, this, I think, uh, what you're saying about, I mean, Abby's just really trying to like appease everyone you like, and, and that means drawing from different kinds of rhetorics, right? That may be sometimes in contradictory to one another. Um, I want to kind of pick out one, maybe one of those. Um, I think that uh, this has been floated a couple of times in this call too, but we just touched on it. This idea of pan-Africanism, right? That's being mobilized, right? Not just by Abiy Ahmed, but also a lot of the pro-regime supporters and justifying what's happening um, um, in Tigray. And I want to invite if Vyantu or other folks want to specifically speak to this concept of pan-Africanism and how that's been mobilized, right? Falsely, right? Uh, or, or, or in a really kind of, um, 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 yeah, just like a uh, bad way, right? To justify a lot of things going on. Um, I'll just go a little bit. I think uh, one of the best things I've read on the this contradiction between this idea of Ethiopia, like as a pan-Africanist um, entity or like a symbol, is written by Safiya Idid, um, except it's in her dissertation, chapter four. It's really like, it's really the most clearest and 
useful take that I've read, um, but we're all just gonna have to wait for the book, sadly. Um, but I think part of, um, Safia uses the Somali case to explain, for example, in the 1960s, how Haile Selassie is able to get the other African leaders on his side in building the consensus to keep the colonial borders in check. And at this time, Ethiopia had already annexed uh, part of um, Somali territories and Somali nationalists were fighting to get that territory back. And they were um, at all of these meetings, you know, series of meetings between different um, political groups um, in the country discussing the future of Africa. And the Somalis are saying, how are you ignoring the fact that our African neighbor has annexed our, our land? And is this not what we're fighting when we're fighting against colonialism? And so like, this is like some of the early debates um, on this question. But I think um, what remains is the contra in the contradiction is that a lot of people imagine Ethiopia, the state as a symbol of Pan-Africanism, but like, how do we reconcile that with the fact that Minilik is a colonialist. He participated in the colonization of indigenous groups all through um, what is most of what is now Ethiopia. Um, and the fact that he's a colonialist is embedded in the oral narratives of different groups. Um, I look specifically at Oromo oral narratives. Um, Oromos call this experience a colonial experience. They describe it in ways very similar to what other uh, colonized people have described their experience. And so I guess the question is like, what do you do with them? I guess with the mythology versus the actual lived experience and the actual historical experience of people who've been colonized by Ethiopia? Other thoughts on this from others? Or if anyone wants to just talk about anything, jump on any thread they, they want to want to discuss? I just want to add something. I know I talked so long. I'm going to try to say it real quick. Is that I do want to emphasize as much as we're talking about state sanctioned, like there is a problem that like the quote unquote Ethiopian crowd is super fascist. Like I think that people really, really need to understand this. This is a state that declared war on Tigray right after the U.S. election and is now demanding a million diaspora return to protect the so-called integrity of the state by the day after January 6th. And we, when we think to those January 6 photos, not to minimize the role of uh, homegrown white supremacists, but we also saw people with the Hindu, uh, Hindu fascist crowd that was uh, present there, right? And so a lot of the missing disinformation, a lot of the political organizing that we're seeing is happening in the like Maryland DC area. There's been reports of diaspora being murdered like in different regions of the West. Like this is real and this is serious. And part of it is, we're not just talking about mythology and discourse just somewhere out there, but this is something that people have taken up and decentralized and brought into their every day. And the genocide is not just happening in some political sphere just in the battlefield, but it's happening, you know, it's happening when the state is giving a press conference and directing all of their anger towards Tigray, of, around Tigray to one specific individual in the diaspora. It's happening all through the line. And I just, uh, to the first example that I gave in the beginning about Woodrow Wilson and the White House, like I think, you know, people got to catch up because there's, you know, over 100 million people in this state and many of them are like being mobilized. Like there has been an all call, an all out call for all civilians. They closed down the high school supposedly to do agrarian work but to mobilize and support this war, like this is serious. Yeah, thanks for naming that. Um, I'm I'm thinking of another thread that maybe we want to push. If, if maybe Mabel wants to want, want to speak more to this, I think we're discussing the question of of refugees, right? Of folks fleeing um, um, Tigrayans, fleeing fleeing what's happening in the region, right? To to areas from, and also of course with the region government returning, right, forcibly returning a lot of um, refugees back to Ethiopia, or some folks fleeing to Sudan, right? And and I you know I think uh, wonder if we want to speak more about the relationship of these different states, right? Um, surrounding Ethiopia, and also the specific questions of of of, um, uh, of folks who are fleeing the region. How does that interact with these these other kind of um, state actors in the region? And here, here, maybe I want to kind of briefly flag your really, yeah, really amazing and powerful article on the cut, right? On 
my Instagram family ever be free, right? Which touches a lot on, on your own very powerful personal experience in relationship to the topic of, of refugees. And yeah, I just want to see if you have any more thoughts on, on that issue. Thank you, Promise. I appreciate that you read it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so Sudan has been a kinder, a kinder and even gentler nation to, to Grians than Ethiopia has. Um, they, Sudan has welcomed us. It's taken care of us. It's birthed us. I was born in Sudan, as well as my sister. And so um, a lot of the Tugarians who fled and were able to escape and to the refugee camps this time, some of them are second time refugees. They are right back where they were 30 some years ago, 20 some years ago. Um, some of them never even left and have just stayed there and are welcoming their family back. And so it has been really, really devastating. One of the hardest parts of it is that um, Ethiopia closed the border very quickly because what happened was once the telecommunication and everything was shut down and blackout was done, including journalists, meaning that we have not had um, journalists able to go throughout Tigray. The most they've been able to get into is to Megala. Um, Nima from CNN was able to get into the border of Aksum, like not even all the way in, but was stopped by Eritrean soldiers, by Ethiopian soldiers. It was an entire mess. It's, everything is online and I would definitely, definitely uh, read that to, to learn exactly how horrible it was. But what the Ethiopian government did is once there was a little over 60 some thousand um, Tigrayans who fled and escaped to Sudan and to the refugee camps, they closed the border because that's how we were able to see what was happening. We saw this huge line of Tigrayans leaving Tigray, f fleeing, and that did not look good for the prime minister after he just said civilians weren't being killed, nothing was happening to civilians in Tigray. That looks horrible for you. You know, you look like a liar, which he is. And so um, they closed the borders and would not let any other Tigrayans out. Now the air, the border where Sudan and Tigray meet is where Humara is. And that has become an, a horrible place for Tigrayans to be currently. There's concentration camps. There are just mass killings. They're being tied up and thrown into the water after being shot. And the reason we know that is because the Tigrayan refugees in Sudan are taking them out of the river, finding bodies, looking them over, seeing who they're related to. And so a lot of our, our news, a lot of the stories that we're able to hear are through the refugees. And so that's just been hard on so many different levels. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, just being a refugee, but living a refugee's life means that there is, you're constantly looking for home. You're constantly searching for somewhere to be home, for something to be yours, for an anchor. And so it hurts me that 60 plus thousand people are feeling the way that I feel, or that there are children who are being born in these camps who will grow up the life that I've lived. It's unfair, and I just don't wish that upon anyone. Um, growing up for me, Tigray was always the goal. Tigray is always like, one day I will have a home in Tigray that is mine, I will retire there, and that will be my home eventually. Eventually I will find home. So for this to happen again is just, it sucks, it really sucks. Um, but I am grateful to Sudan that we have a nation there that is welcoming to us, even in the midst of all of the turmoil that they are going through, the coups and the, it seems to be a new war with Ethiopia, um, but I'm grateful to, to Sudan for sure. All right, Sigur, do you want to speak? Yeah, yeah I was just, um, I know we're like coming up, um, on our time, but I just wanted to, um, last thoughts. I think this government has done all that it can to portray this war as a war between uh, one good side and a bad side, or as a war between a federal government and a regional government. But I think that the most useful way to view this war is as, as a reflection of the enduring crisis of the Ethiopian state, a crisis that we've noted happens in a cyclical manner. This cycle has proven to be so incomprehensibly violent. And imagine that, you know, we've heard, we have not even fully heard of all the atrocities and, um, and all the suffering in Tigray. We've just begun to hear of the suffering in Amhara region, of the suffering in Afar. Um, yes, but also I think the state-sponsored attacks against people in Oromia, um, there was uh, Abagadas that were just killed. These are um, Oromo political leaders. Um, 
elders that were killed while they were in the middle of an indigenous political um, discussion. And the fact that this government is going after not just people in Oromia, but in Benishangu Gumus, um, against the command, and against all who are resisting this centralizing um, project and or iteration of it, um, really tells me that this war is far from over and that we're going to, we haven't yet seen the worst part. And I think that who needs our solidarity is not the nation state of Ethiopia. Who needs our solidarity is those who are on the receiving end of the violence of the state. Um, thank you. Yeah, as, yeah, and as pointed out, we're, we're in our last five minutes. So um, I'll, I'll pose maybe a couple of general things, but, but feel free to um, maybe, maybe everyone can kind of say a little something you feel like would be helpful to wrap up. But, you know, one thing I just want to underline is, yeah, what, what are, um, I think we're touching on this already, but, but what are some of the stuff that folks can do to support and show solidarity, um, especially in the diaspora and in the international community? Um, and uh, I think someone else is actually also asking on online about, um, uh, you know, if, if folks have like a couple of lines who want to address this, what, what is the local base of support? Like the, the dynamics uh, and composition of, of the pro-regime's base right what, who are these types of people right and what are they influenced by and, and and the composition um but you know feel free to feel free to just touch on that or, or not but um yeah i want to make space for everyone to give um maybe some final comments as i said uh along some of these lines or um any other things you want to talk about well we only got four minutes so i'm gonna keep this real real quick uh to answer your questions in reverse order to who is the base of this regime i mean there's a hardcore military wing some of the worst atrocities have been committed by fano the amahara regional government but it's also your doctor in the dmv it's also your uh professor at such and such major western university you know in toronto in new york at duke university these are regular regular people and the same way that we see RSS training camps happening in Long Island, in Texas, the fascists are here. They're not somewhere out over there. Even for some diaspora, I think people would like to stay depoliticized and disengage with what's going on over there in that other place my parents came from. But this stuff is very much here in your face. One. Uh, two is that I just wanted to say thank you. This is so dope. Look at this. I am so happy to have this solidarity, y'all. Not that we are like the spokespeople, each of us, for Oromia and Tigray, but, you know, for too long, the solidarity has been defined by what I call the uncles, right? Like this very specific, rigid political project of men who are like over 55 and wait for us to bring chai and coffee, right? And so I think another way is possible, and this is very despairing under this intensity of violence, but I think another, there's other political realities that are possible that we can have solidarity with and bring into being, but we need new kinds of formations and spaces like this. Yes, I want to say thank you too. This has been a really good experience. I was very, very nervous. Y'all know I had, I was anxious, but you hooked me up and made me feel better. I wanted to touch on um, the, what Khadija was just saying, the Ethiopian restaurant owners, they're the ones who are funding this. When you go to Little Ethiopia in your area, that's who's funding it. And I don't mean to do this to little businesses and small businesses in the United States. We've all been affected by COVID. I understand it. But those Ethiopian restaurants that you're going to and getting your injera from are funding this genocide. And so I think it's really good to be conscious of what you're eating because my family may be starving. So they are. And they're the ones calling the cops on the blacks because they don't associate themselves as black. Whereas we do because we are. You see me. But anyhow, um, I just really want to say thank you. I'm so grateful that this happened. I think it's really important. Um, we need as many allies as possible, especially the ones who are being killed. So yeah, please stand with us. And if you would like to actually take action, you can go on to TigrayActionCommittee.com and we have action items. We have a lot of things for you to do, like call your legislator. We have a script for you to read through. There's a lot. So please go to the website and do something. Um, sorry, I know we're like running out of time. Just quickly, I just wanted to say like, you know, like in terms of like who's who's back in this who's back in this government aside from like people who ideologically deeply identify with this government i've also noticed that it's just like people who i think unless we've gone through some sort of like political education like 
most of us identify with the countries with which in which they were born and we tend to like really believe and take for granted like what governments say and i know that for people living in ethiopia not believing the government line and not championing it has been actually like uh reason enough to be taken to to prison um and to be targeted by the state for the diaspora i mean like there's more choices but people are still like so wedded to the nation state as an idea. So like, if you wanna know where your Ethiopian friends stand on this war, ask them and you will know quickly because they don't hide it, yeah. Great, thank you so much, uh, everyone. A lot of really generative thoughts and I'm sure this is uh, not the end, right, to the conversation on Ethiopia, as a lot of folks are already saying. I want to kind of quickly highlight, right, and I think this is surfacing throughout the call too, right, the tremendous amount of, of, of care, of intentionality needed, right, for just the speakers here, right, to sort through a lot of these contradictions and pressures, right, whether it's social media or, or the physical violence, right, the genocidal violence from the government itself, what does it mean to, to live through that and to, to try to, to, try to um, yeah, live, live your own life and to process these contradictions with others. And so I just want to really uh, applaud and, and name Right, a lot of these uh, experiences and um, that folks have to go through, but also articulating the nuance, right, in their political analysis in midst of, of all this violence, right, and one-sided uh, rhetoric. Um, and as a way of ending, I'll, I'll just again bump the articles, especially the Phenambulus article um, that Khadija and Ayantu has written. Um, that was super amazing, and especially and again like right, Mabel's article on on cut. Um, but also especially want to thank and. Um, Right, Zoe Sambuzi, and and uh, there, that was actually kind of a previous conversation, right, with Dijia and uh, Ayantu uh, on on the Fnambula site with them, right. So please also check that out. That has actually def you know, definitely paved a lot of the way for a lot of these voices um, to surface with that article and encouraging folks to see how this conversation did not just start right from this webinar, right, but it's actually very ongoing and built on the efforts right of a lot of organizers and intellectual work and organizing that has gone to this. Um, so on that note, uh, thanking everyone again, and I guess I'll wrap the event here and see folks on other movement spaces uh, in the future. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.